Welcome to another shitty video, and this one's going to be about the things I'd like to see in Team Fortress 2 Classic. Now, I have a bit of a cold, and I might sound a little off, so I'm sorry about that, but it is what it is. But uh, I don't have enough content about Open Fortress or things I want to say about Open Fortress, so instead of making a whole new video, I'm going to put that at the end of this one, so heads up. Um, but starting off with the number one thing I'd like to see in Team Fortress 2 Classic is new weapons. And, you know, that that's kind of vague, but I, I like new weapons that change how you play a class or just new mechanics, you know, things that change how you fundamentally play. And what's in there now is fun, it's fine, but it doesn't really change how you play most of the classes. And let me give a few examples of that. Well, number one is the Tranquilizer Spy. Uh, the Tranquilizer Gun is fine, but... It, it it you know base twenty damage monochrome vision slow aim when you're hit by it slow move speed and you do like eighty eighty damage uh, butter knives on tranked enemies so it's useful but it it kind of makes spy in a more support role where you're tranquilizing people from a distance more or less to help your teammates than you are to do it to you know to use it offensively but it, it it's it's not really changing how you play Spy too terribly much. And since it's a, a, a single-shot projectile, it's not really something that a lot of people use in it other than to be annoying. But it does kind of make Spy a more support-based, which I I enjoy helping my team more than I do uh, getting one backstab and immediately dying. But it, it, it doesn't really change how you play Spy all that much. The only weapon in the game that I can think of that genuinely changes how you play the class is the nail gun for the scout, where the scout is typically based around being up in your face and dealing meat shots, massive damage, you know, being in your face. The nail gun does the opposite, where you try and keep your distance with it, and you you know you're trying to be annoying, you're trying to you know deal because a nail gun does do damage if you can land those nails, but it kind of lets you do the spray and pray tactic instead of being up in people's faces. But the thing is that the nail gun is kind of a weaker option comparatively because you're not dealing, even if you land all your nails, you're not dealing nearly enough damage to really be that effective. And it may, it kind of forces a scout to be near his team to, to really be decent. Because since it's not dealing good enough damage like the scatter does, you're not as good of a flanker because you can't deal damage. And it kind of... It, in, in a funny way, it kind of makes scout more scout based. Where if you do want to flank, you're going to be scouting out an area uh, more than you are actually going to be, you know, picking off uh, key targets and all that. But it, it's still effective. It's a good weapon and it's fun to use. But it, it, it's kind of a weaker option comparatively, you know, especially when you compare it to the scatter gun. But the nail gun's really the only one that fundamentally fundamentally changes how you play a class. You know, the RPG for Soldier, it, you're not really playing Soldier too differently, except you're focusing more on, you know, dealing good damage with your rocket launcher, your RPG, and then switching to your shotgun, like, to, to finish up or follow up with something. You know, it's it doesn't really change how you play Soldier too terribly much. You know, the uh, the Dynamite Pack with Demo Man, you know, you're more or less using it like you would your Sticky Bomb Launcher instead of, you know being that guy sticky spamming you know you're you say it was you know you're using a sticky bomb launcher to clear an engineer nest you know you, you use the dynamite pack like that where you're essentially just kind trying to clear out a, an area you know especially engineer's nest stuff like that but it doesn't really change how you play demo man too terribly much and the mine layer is weak like it's not bad but it, it's co uh, again, comparatively, it's a weaker option because you only get four mines in total, and that's it. You don't get eight, and those four mines don't really cover enough area to really be good enough. That only, like, it's good at putting on an objective, like a point, uh, the cart, or something like that. But it's not, it's not useful aside from that because you can't like set it around a door frame and you know, kill the entire enemy team. You might kill one or two people, but you're definitely not killing the entire enemy team. It's just the layer comparatively is a really weak option. Um, it's a good model, though. I like the way the weapon looks. Um, 
you know, medic, uh, the shock therapy, you know, the little Jacob's ladder thing, you know, I like the concept of that. In fact, if I recall, when I was originally playing the beta version of the game, I do remember bringing that up to like somebody on one of the servers. I was like, Hey, what if we had like the hypodermic needle and like, you could like hit enemies and it like kept your health from them. And then you can like hit your teammate and give them a bunch of health. But that may or may not just be a coincidence, but, uh, the whole general idea of the shock therapy is that you hit your teammate and you like instantly overheal them and it has to recharge. And it also does like 150 damage, I think some around, no, not 150 damage. I don't think, but it does a good hefty damage. If you have a full charge with it and you hit somebody with it, it does good damage, but it's still not really fundamentally changing how you play the class, except maybe people got to get health packs more because if you use the shock therapy, you got a 15 minus heal rate. And then you have the Uber Spritze, and it's just the Uber Saw. It, it's not really changing how you play Medic. It's literally just the Uber Saw, except now you have 10 less health. It's like... I think the Hunting Revolver kind of changes how you play Sniper, but at the end of the day, not really, no. Because Hunting Revolver, you got a 6 clip size, you deal 120 on headshot, you deal 40 on a body shot, and... It does kind of force you to get closer because, like, you can't just snipe with it because sniping just does not work with it. But, I know that sounds weird, but you can't, you know, just stay in your back lines and, you know, snipe with the hunting revolver. That's not effective at all. you got to get a little close. But if you're a semi-competent sniper, even with the stock sniper rifle, you're still going to be kind of up and close and pushing with the team, especially on offense. Um... But it's still not really fundamentally changing how you play Sniper. Especially if you're using the Huntsman. Uh, which I don't know why they'd give the, the Hunting Revolver when you're also adding in the Huntsman. That makes no sense, but it is what it is. You know, I'd like to see weapons that change how you play classes. You know, like, um, give Engineer new buildings. Uh, I know they're adding in some kind of jump pad, but in the next update, which is like fucking taking two three years almost as long as valve fucking does but and that's something they don't like mentioning you mentioning in the discord server in fact i think it gets you like temporarily muted or banned or something if you mention how long it takes for updates to get out i mean they're doing it for free yeah that's fair but i mean come on now you guys were working on this while you had a nine month hiatus you're, st you're telling me you didn't get anything done well, that's besides the point. You know, the jump pad is kind of questionable on how useful it's going to be because the engineer already has the coil gun, and the coil gun, you can overload it and do a blast jump with it. So why would you need a jump pad if you can already blast jump with the coil gun? It don't make no sense. It just doesn't make any sense to have the coil gun and also add the jump pad later. Like, an artillery sentry would be cool. Like a century based around shooting projectiles or lobbing artillery shells at people. It had, like, let's say a longer range. It does heavier damage, but at extremely slow fire rate or something like that, you know? Just new stuff that changes how you would play a class. Um, just something new is all I'm asking for, you know? Which, they are going to add new stuff, but something that actually feels different, you know? The next thing I would like... Uh, to see in Team Fortress 2 Classic is new classes, but that's probably not going to happen. Um, the thing is that in the 2016 beta of Team Fortress 2 Classic, they had deathmatch mode still in there, and there was a class called the Mercenary in, the other, in there, and on certain servers, you could play with the Mercenary with the other nine classes. And it was fun. It was fun being able to pick up everybody's weapons, you know, use a rocket launcher, and also the medigun on the Mercenary. It was fun. And I'd like to see that at least be something optional in the game, but I highly doubt it's going to happen. Like, the Mercenary itself would uh, is genuinely all I would ask for. Like, just an optional, just an optional thing for certain servers. I think it would absolutely be a cool thing to add. And Open Fortress even lets you do that on, on some of their servers, that you just play the base game with the Mercenary in there. And it's, it's cool, it's fun to do. But I highly doubt they're going to do that. Uh, especially since they kind of have espionage mode on hiatus, and it's made all the worse that, you know, they kind of split deathmatch mode into its own mod called Team Fortress... I think it's Team Fortress Deathmatch or something like that. 
and the developers of that mod have said nothing. Their Twitter, in fact, I don't even think their Twitter account has any tweets. They've just said nothing. And it's made all the worse, again, by the fact that Open Fortress exists, and it's a deathmatch-based mod. But it it is what it is. You know, I understand why they don't want to add all these crazy classes and all that, but it's still something I'd like to see. I'd like to see the mercenary be used again. And uh, I think the third and final thing I'd like to see is... This is kind of a two-parter with this, but number one is a four-team dedicated server. For some odd reason, and it's the mo I'm pretty sure it's the most popular game mode on Team Fortress 2 Classic is four-team. I might be wrong about that, but the Vault F4 servers, now that they're free of directly Opossum, are now tolerable to be on, uh, and they have like a 24-7 VIP server, 24-7 payload, but why the fuck do they not have a 24-7 four-team mode? Like, it'd be like the number one mode you'd want to advertise, and nobody picks four-team mode on the Vault F4 servers. Like, occasionally they will, but... Most of the time, you're going to be repeating uh, Bad Water, Powerhouse, uh, Harvest, and that's pretty much it. You know, it's not fun to play the same maps over and over. And I would really like to be able to just hop on a server and play 14 mode, especially since community servers on the mod don't really have any 14 dedicated server no more. And I used to play on one. But I think, I, I don't know what happened to the, the server owner. I think they may have ran out of money, technical problems. I don't know. But, you know, there's no dedicated four-team servers that I know of anymore. And, you know, Vault F4 doesn't have one. So, side tangent aside, the most important thing with four-team that I'd like to see addressed is new maps and game modes specific for four-team. Now, my thing is, is that four-team the maps they add for it are just not designed for four team domination hydro is a bad map i'm I'm not even going to sugarcoat it domination hydro is a, a, a doo-doo map it is garbage and it's one simple reason why it's hard to defend your point like there's no good sentry spots that aren't immediately sniped from all directions you know there's that once like panel of scrap metal on the red spawn that you can put a sentry behind and it gives you like a perfect spot for the sentry to shoot at the point and it has pretty good coverage from the like the other sides that enemies will come from but in general most of the points on domination hydro they're hard to like have good sentry spots for making engineer nearly fucking useless because you're you're gonna put your sentry down in one spot and it's gonna get sniped by people coming through on like the three fucking areas that they're gonna come from on most of the points so there's no good way to defend your point, so it becomes this whole big round of chaos, made even worse by the fact that it's domination mode. All four teams are going to have at most six players on there, and everybody's just running around the map going going to do their own thing, and all the action, all the all the chaos, all the fightings in like spread around the spread around the map, and it, it's not designed for that mode. Like, four team is not designed for, for domination because all the chaos, all the actions spread around. King of the Hill is a perfect mode for four team because all, the four, all four teams have to focus on the single point in the middle of the map. That means all the action, all the fighting, all the, all the chaos is going to be focused and concentrated into one particular point on the map. Uh, Capture the Flag is a mode that could per work perfectly with four team if and that's a big if the intelligence the flag is in the middle of the map and you have to it's like a neutral flag you have to capture it and you have to bring it to your intelligence your intel room right instead of each team has their own intelligence and you play to three and immediately the game's over because fucking uh, yellow team decided to zerg everybody you know it, the the maps that they have out now for four team is Dom Hydro and that one arena map. I think there's two arena maps. I might be wrong about that, but with the maps that come with it, arena is pretty much the only mode that works for four team. And arena mode's fun, but I'd still like to play something else, you know. But I, I'd really like to see new maps that work for four team. Uh, new maps in general, but most importantly for four team since there's such a lack of it. But 
getting on to Open Fortress. And I'm, I'm going to keep this brief, or try to at least, but I'm going to go ahead and give a, a, a warning for certain people, because I, I know people don't like it when I get into politics, uh, most people at least. Uh, seeing the 96 dislikes on my, uh, you know, Save TF2 video kind of put it in perspective that people really don't like it whenever I call people out for being cultural Marxist. Now, I'm just going to put it simply. I don't like the Open Fortress dev team. And um, there's a pretty simple reason why. Uh, they're cultural Marxist. And I know everybody's going to be like, Nazi term, oh, that's what the Nazis use. It doesn't matter. The term still applies. Now, a cultural Marxist is essentially a Marxist that instead of seizing the means of production, they seize culture. And the whole idea of a Marxist revolution is that you seize the means of productions for the workers and you establish a revolution or whatever. With cultural Marxism, you do that through culture. And the thing is that cultural Marxists have gotten into all our major institutions, you know, our, our, and this is talking about America, of course, but they got into academia, they got into the media, they got into the entertainment industry, comics, literally everything. So they're, they're, they're everywhere and they hate you. They hate everything about you. They literally want you to literally have nowhere to go. They do it to your movies, your comics, your video games, your, your your fucking your grocery store. They do it to everything. And this is where the whole woke agenda shit comes from. It's cultural Marxism. And I know in my previous videos I call these people leftists, liberals. I use all these terms. But for the sake of clarity, for now on, I'm going to try and refer to these people as cultural Marxists. Because I think it's a term that fits them very well. Now... The thing is that the dev teams of both Team Fortress 2 Classic and Open Fortress are a little bit more left-leaning, but especially with Open Fortress. Open Fortress has a big problem with, you know, trannies. I'm just going to I'm just going to be honest. They got a problem with trannies, faggots, uh just these people that I just can't stand for the sheer fact that they don't let you have any fun. They, they favor censorship, they only exist in areas where there's censorship, and they don't like uh, the idea that people can say whatever they want. And, you know, at least with on the TF2C Discord, you can cut up and have fun and make jokes. Not, not on the Open Fortress one, not at all. Um, but if you go to the Frequently Asked Questions section of the Open Fortress website, and you go to the Story section, uh, you know, it says, What's the backstory of the Deathmatch game mode? The answer is, in a nutshell, it's the 1970s, and the gravel wars are finally over. Man code, TF Industries, red and blue uh, teams have all collapsed, with the whereabouts of both the administrator and Olivia Man currently unknown. The resulting power vacuum has caught the attention of mysterious, shadowy figures from the global criminal underworld who have begun employing freelance mercenaries to carry out their top-secret orders. These mostly consist of looting the now abandoned facilities of the old mega corporations rumored to contain top secret experimental weapons and mysterious artifacts of incredible power. For more information, check out the briefings for individual maps. There's a lot you can learn about the current state of the TF world from those humble chalkboard messages. And then there's another question below that. What parts of TF2 lore are considered canon in Open Fortress? The answer was, pretty much all the events of the official TF2 timeline are fair game, including the Team Fortress comic series. However, and this is important, however, with the seventh and final installment of TF Comics currently under unreleased, we have chosen to keep aftermath of hypothetical issue number seven intentionally vague, only setting a few basic facts in stone the disappearance of the administrator, a living man, the bankruptcy of Manco, and keeping our focus on the here and now of the groovy 70s. As far as th that decade is concerned, almost anything goes. So I forgot, it's actually in this next part that is important. Not that one. That one was fine. The question was, what are your world-building goals? And the answer was, and this is the important part. I know I screwed up that. We're embracing the opportunity to venture further out into the wider world of Team Fortress, beyond the confines of Red, Blue, and Manco. In particular, and this is the important part, in particular, the hyper-masculine, chaotic presentation of TF2 from 2010 onwards has been considerably downplayed, and references to characters such as Saxon Hell and the TF2 Mercs will mostly 
act as brief name checks rather than fully fledged crossovers. So, the thing is, is that they literally, and in the standard cultural Marxist fashion, they literally take a recognizable IP, a recognizable thing, you know, like they did with Superman, with Batman, with fucking uh, Spider-Man, like they did with the Lord of the Rings, you know, Amazon did with the Lord of the Rings and it fucking flopped, you know? They take a recognizable thing, make it their own, and then, like, do away with almost everything that was loved about that recognizable thing. And you can't say, it's a conspiracy theorist. Yeah, remember, it's a... It's the SJW room of a dial. <laughs> you, you can say all that. But a conspiracy theory stops being a conspiracy when it happens to everything and it's real. It stops being a conspiracy when it's fucking real. You know how Alex Jones talked about the gay frogs and everybody called that a conspiracy? Until the scientists found out that the gay frogs were being gay because of chemicals in the water? And I'm not like a whole Alex Jones fan, but you gotta give the guy some credit. But, literally... T of 2 was built upon the idea of being this uber-masculine game, a man's game, you know, kind of homoerotic vibes between medic and, and fucking heavy, you know. It, that's literally the foundation of the game. That That is literally the entire foundation of the story of the games. You know, for fuck's sake, Australia is like, pretty much like, super powerful aliens in the canon of fucking uh, T of 2, and they're all like manly men, like... Shit, uh, Dale Conagher and his his fucking grandpa or whatever got exposed to Australium and he grew like, fuck, he fucking became a massive man with a hairy Texas outline on his chest, you know. It was literally the foundation of TF2, TF2's, excuse me, lore, is being hyper-masculine. So, like, I don't, I don't like the Open Fortress dead team. I don't, I just don't. Uh, the mod is fine. I'm not telling you to not go play the mod. It's not like, unless they have like some malware or spyware or some shit in there, I, I'm not going to tell you not to download the mod. It's free. It's not going to give them any money. Uh, the mod's good. The mod is fun. I will give them a lot of credit for that. They know how to program. I don't. I will give them credit for having programming socks, but I that doesn't change the fact that I have every right to just not like the dev team. But it goes even further with the fact that the dev team is working on espionage mode. You know where espionage mode comes from? Team Fortress 2 Classic, a game mode that they're still supposedly working on. And the Open Fortress dev team said, "Yeah, no, we're just going to we're going to take that idea. We're going to we're going to steal that from you. That's ours now." No, I don't. I don't like that. That's not cash money, man. And yeah, sure, you can say, "Oh, this is free stuff. It's not like it's copyrighted." No, that's not the point. Ideal plagiarism is plagiarism, as uh, I've heard many cultural Marxists say and shit like that. Plagiarism, plagiarism is plagiarism. That doesn't change the fact that them taking something that's not in the that's in the public domain, that's free, that's not um, copyrighted or anything like that. That doesn't change the fact that that that's not. You know, that's scummy. That's not cool to do, man. You just you don't get to do that. But though I know it's kinda petty to have grievances with the with the dev team for that reason, but honestly, I just can't I just can't be bothered to really give a shit. Because at the end of the day, it's a good mod. Uh what's in the mod currently isn't necessarily some cultural Marxist agenda, at least to my knowledge it's not. But I do imagine in the future that they're going to do that. As the uh, frequently asked question answer said, that they're going to try and move away from the hyper-masculine uh, lore of TF2. So, it is what it is. But at the end of the day, I don't have to play it. I, I can just play Team Fortress 2 Classic and be perfectly happy. But, if you like the video... Like, comment, and subscribe. If you uh, hate me and you think I'm some evil, racist, bigot Nazi, please tell me in the comments below. I love fucking arguing with people on the internet. It's so much fun to waste my time doing that. Have a lovely day.